All right, so we have an exciting development proposal to share with you today called Metro Lofts, and it's a vibrant, sustainable, mixed-use development um, that will happen on a site that is destined for redevelopment. So uh, let's go ahead and... What happened? I just pressed OK. That's probably updating the or something. That's perfect timing. That's why you cannot... It is Metro Lost. So just a synopsis before we walk through. It's 253 residential units, 15,000 square feet of retail on a 3.17 acre site. But before I tell you more about the project, let me tell you about our team. We are on track Realty Solutions. We have Taylor Spenla, he's our in-house architect, uh, but he thinks more like a developer. Ryan Beck, who's experienced on construction uh, and also helped us work the financials. I have an eye for design and a passion for sustainability, and then Craig helped with the acquisitions and logistics of the site. So we are Taylor, Ryan, Abby, Craig, we are on track. And we embrace an integrated design process. So having four diverse backgrounds on our team, we thought it was important to constantly be evaluating the feasibility of this deal, not only from the economics, but also the marketing, the land acquisition, um, sustainability, just constantly kind of making sure that we were on track with our solution. And that led us to Metro Lofts. So the project entails uh, 253 residential units, 1,500 square feet of retail on um, the street front, 289 parking spaces, and for a total uh, project IRR of 20.2%. And Ryan's going to tell you where it is. So the site has been on the radar of a lot of developers for a number of years. It's nestled right there on 7th and 4th East, or 7th South and 4th East. Um, it, it's uncontested, the, the growth for the region right here. What's that? Okay. So it's, it's only footsteps away from all the amenities that you have uh, a lot of restaurants and equidistance to the U and the business district as well. So that's, that's a little bit about the site. So currently, this the the building plant that's there is. And this is the infamous hostess site for those of you who might still be working. Right. Hmm. Right. Um, so sorry, I haven't. Um, so yeah, with with this site, it's the infamous hostess site. Um, The baker of Twinkies, Ho Ho's, and um, Wonder Bread. Some of the history we, we watched with bated breath as the as the uh, as Hostess said that they would file for bankruptcy and sell all their assets last year. Just as of last week, Franz Bakeries has acquired um, this parcel along with many other parcels, and the site. Um, they're, they're looking for uh, a solution to uh, put together, combine a lot of their other bread making facilities into a, a single into a single spot. So we're we're proposing to do a land swap, which will make this site feasible for redevelopment within the next year or, or within the near future. So it's three point one seven acres. Uh, you can see that it's 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 a uh, it's kind of been pieced together over the years. This is very functionally obsolete with the design the way it is, and um, they have very little access for delivery trucks. They're using an outdated side loading platform, and uh, the, the plant is really, really limited in its productivity capabilities. There's also some remediation issues that are going on there as well. So we're proposing to uh, purchase the property. We have a letter of intent at thirty-eight dollars a square foot, and that is comparable to other land sales in the in the area. So part of the zoning is um, we've we've worked closely with the city. Any any good developer knows if you don't have political and zoning uh, things figured out, then 
you're going to be you're going to be off track. So part of this zoning, the zoning changed last year uh, to transit station area core and transition areas. Part of our part of our approach is to work very closely with the city and to do that integrated design process. And the development scorecard that we've that we've worked together with the city gets us in a position where we can fast track permitting, and um, we're we're our our design aligns straight with their vision. So essentially we feel like it's a perfect storm. The zoning changed in November last year. The site just became available. Literally, the uh, judge approved the bankruptcy two weeks ago, the bankruptcy proceedings and the sale to France. So we feel confident that the site is uh, it's something we can acquire reasonably. Um, and as we looked at the site, obviously it's, the, the building is obsolete and we took a, look of, took a look at what the market in that area was demanding. So the market profile, we had a, a higher than average uh, secondary education, more two thirds were dual income, and over 50,000 vehicles a day passed that site. When we started to consider the fact that this walk score would earn a walk score of 88, and um, that, that would put it among the top 10 locations in Salt Lake for walkability. We identified our relative mix, and instead of focusing on one aspect in particular, we do feel like there will be a blend but our target market is Gen Y. And fortunately, we have intimate knowledge about what Gen Y is looking for um, in a residential space. So we uh, anticipate a mix of new household formations, single heads of household, university students, and a portion of downsizing baby boomers as well. We also identified a potential overlap in what boomers and uh, Gen Y are looking for. We realized that there are some differences, but there's a lot of similarities and we think that we can take advantage of that. All right, so we could, looked at the comparables, other properties in the area, Immigration Court, Lotus Apartments, of course, um, Palladio Apartments, and then looking at all those based on what the size of the unit and the rent rates, our Metro loss falls right within line of what the market is demanding. All of those properties, although Lotus Apartments is still pre-leasing, the rest had less than 5% vacancy. So here we are, Metro Lofts. Um, to give you a little bit of an idea of what, what drove our design, we did go for density. Our parking requirement on the site is zero. The city does not require any parking for this particular location because it is transit station uh, zoning, but we did choose to pursue a 1.1 parking ratio. And our, we've done our heaviest uh, design aspects on the 400, 7, 700 east. So the design, I'm going to walk you through a little bit about what, how we laid this out. Um, we have all structured parking that is under our units on the, the ground floor. We have retail at the street, street side on the 700 East and 400 South. In the rear, we have a little bit of, uh, of surface parking, but really we are anticipating that for redevelopment later. The facade is, is modern material, or modern design with natural materials. That's what we're going for. We're targeting Gen Y. And we really looked at streamlining construction by identifying products that, that helped us uh, embrace that modern style, but also was quick for construction. Here's the way that uh, the massing looks. What we've done is we've focused these apartments so they open up on a nucleus that is the courtyard. And that is meant to serve as something where the community can gather its, uh, its community space. We felt like this was also an opportunity for urban agriculture and reduce the overall heat island impact of the site. You can see here, because of zoning, we are able to achieve uh, five stories of residential on the front and four stories on the rear. And then we're opening up the, onto those green spaces through the courtyard. A little bit about the units. The units are very open. It's intended to be a loft style. We have a uh, storefront, uh, glazing, and exposed ductwork. We are looking at uh, polished concrete floors, truly embracing the urban loft feel. Our ultimate unit, unit mix was 66 studio units, 91 bedroom, and 97 two bedrooms, which gives us a total of 38% being two bedroom units. Our methodology on construction, and this is where we felt it was our 
right, if not our obligation as students to push the limits a little bit. We chose to go with tilt up concrete. We understand that this is going to shorten our construction timeline, but not only that, we are in spending our money on our building envelope um, that will simultaneously be our exposed finish, or our interior finishes. So we're able to take six months out of construction time that returns $250,000 um, out of our interest reserve, and our product will go up faster, hit the market sooner. Focusing on modern, we are using recycled glass countertops, curtain wall system, uh, exposed concrete, and modern glass rails. And we chose to, to pledge to attain the Architecture 2030 Challenge. This is a focus on life cycle analysis of the building. So we invested our, the majority of our sustainability budget towards the structure of the building, the most permanent element. The Architecture 2030 Challenge is considering the life cycle of that building and ensuring that it ages properly. And efficiency. So the way that we approach efficiency, we feel like sustainability is possible like when we embrace a, a cost transfer philosophy. So like I said, in increasing the thermal envelope of the building, therefore spending less on the mechanical systems as we do that. Um, same thing on our soft costs. We feel like it's, it's possible to achieve this at a zero net cost impact, aside from, uh, and, and we didn't choose cert third party certifications. So we don't have those fees on top of it. Some case studies that we looked at. Uh, these are properties that are across the country because there isn't anything necessarily like this in Utah. But we looked at properties in California and Florida that embrace tilt up and modern, and we looked at what their construction costs per, work, per square foot were. We feel like we can cut a lot of the construction costs by embracing these technologies. Same with over South Town. So our, the takeaways on the uh, comparables, uh, I'm sorry, the case studies was that we feel tilt up concrete is definitely feasible. Modularization allows us to short, uh, shorten our construction timeline, and we embrace efficiency and sustainability at hand in hand. So we are pursuing a triple bottom line. Our, some of our sustainability attributes include mechanical ventilation, um, operable windows, and a whole building system. So we're embracing BIM modeling that will uh, allow us to shorten that construction. And then that's, therefore we have a timeline of 10 months for 250 years, which we know is aggressive, but we also think is completely possible. And now the fun stuff. Ryan? Okay. So one of the first things you might notice here is that we have uh, less um, uh, asbestos abatement on this. Um, we, we intend to negotiate a discount on the land purchase price, which would uh, shift the burden um, to, the, to the seller. And so, so we could also do permitting at the same time as um, land acquisition is taking place. Um. You notice our expenses per unit are just slightly lower than what the market is calling for right now. Generally, people are spending forty-two to forty-three thousand per unit um, for expenses. But we felt like some of the finishes that we've chosen have meant that we won't have the same expenses incurred during uh, when we change tenants and things like that. Higher durability finishes, hopefully not incurring the same expenses. But our, our total construction cost is, is, is similar to what other projects are doing. So part of what Abby was suggesting is our expenses are decreased because we are focused on um, uh, reducing the operating expenses. And therefore, how does your, how does your cap rate um, calculate uh, your total value at the end? It's increasing the operating income. So that, that's, that's the approach that we were taking on that. So as you can see with a 6.5% cap rate, which is the market standard at this point, um, we're at a valuation of $42.8 million. And we also talked about maybe doing a blended cap rate uh, because it is mixed use. The developer capital is about 4%, investor capital 22, and 74% for the construction loan. Uh, as you can see, there's a, a, a aggressive or, or a very wonderful leveraged IRR of 20.22%. This gives us a, a, a brief snapshot. All these all these numbers that we've that we've been working with have been 
reviewed by other developers, appraisals, appraisers, and uh, uh, financiers. Uh, we feel that we're right in line with, with the market standards, and we are a little aggressive on our operating expenses, but feel that this is a, a very feasible project approach. So if you're really not convinced that this is a viable site, we've already had 50% uh, uh, retail lease up uh, negotiations with a couple different retailers, and we're ready to go with that. With that. We are looking into the future um, for future potential site development uh, on the bottom of the, of the section here, potential future site. We're, we're postponing development uh, on this area right here so that we can potentially develop if we acquire some of the adjacent properties. Uh, so, there you have it. We, we are aggressively pursuing an efficient and modern design approach, and we invite uh, any of you that are uh, specialties and in, in, uh, understanding of this to partner with us and to help us realize the vision of Metro Loss. Uh, maybe we can go ahead and open it up to the sharks. Uh, I've got a quick, I've got a couple questions. What's your setbacks? Um, on that set, so we are 10 feet from 400 set up, and uh, actually no setback on the Yeah. So are you building right to the property line? We are able to. We set up <coughs> on 700, and then we follow the proper the setbacks on 400. Okay. And where do you anticipate staging? So that's part of why we also aren't developing on that, that piece on 500, uh, on the on 500 South. Yeah. So there's two reasons. The zoning really limits what we can, what we're able to do from a massing standpoint at that spot. But we also felt like that could be our staging area. But the now the tilt-up panels will be constructed off-site and will be brought in on trucks. I know we're short for time, and I want to. Let everyone have a comment, but I do want to say on the thirty-eight dollars a square foot, that doesn't take in cost of demo, right? Right. We so that's just line straight item. line, and then you have a demo line item. Um, okay. Then the the less on the on the abatement cost. <clears throat> What's the demo line item? That is two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Does it have asbestos abatement in too? No. So the asbestos abatement I, I factors it as a different line item. Okay. And because do you? It's something you can't really know until you get in there. So Hill Code nationally represents a lot of these trustees and things. Um, you say acquire it reasonably. Why do you believe it would not be an as is, where is, which is usually most common in this kind of a scenario? Well, yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think it could go, it could go either way. Uh, Franz, the new owner, actually did close on the property last week. And, and the real solution for them is uh, trying to find you know, someone that's willing to build another building and maybe do a swap, or um, they, they, in addition to this asset, they acquired uh, three other plants and uh, 14 depots throughout the West. And so mm -hmm. they, got a, they got a pretty good bargain. This, this property and the property in Seattle, mm -hmm. I think just the value on the land is about half of what they paid for the, you know, the whole project. And so, okay. yeah. And then the, the parking for the retail? How, how was that? How did you? I didn't see that. Yeah, I can go ahead and show you that uh, a little bit better. So we have designated retail parking. Right in front then? or uh, at, Just behind the retail area. So there is no, you can see here, um, there's actually a demising wall between the retail parking and the residential. So each retail area has its own uh, you know, designated parking. So, so you have your one-to-one -one ratio for residential, and then you and have... An extra part of the retail. Oh, that, okay. okay, that's what I was asking. Well, we were able to acquire that by because the the base of the building is actually it's the whole property where the um, residential has courtyards. Okay. Traditionally, you can't do that, um, but we were able to do that because we have. Those so you rely on destination retail because 700 East is primarily like a commuter area. So the walkability score is high, but the practical people walking up and down the street is low. So are you? Well, uh, right now the, the targets that we have is, um, you know, a, a food service and then a, a 
real, real estate company that have already pre-leased, but you know, as far as identifying other potential retailers, um, so we want to go with ribbon retail, smaller retails, so that we can open it up to, few, to more tenants in the space. That was our vision. I would say it seems like the visibility and the ingress egress is a little challenging on this site. Mm -hmm. Would that? It's I just think on that's my. Valid, except that it is across the street from a track station, so yeah. I think you're right. I mean, but, but you can't cross as easy, right? Uh, I mean, not in the middle of the street. Right, I know. <laughs> but the only way to access the the tracks is through the crosswalks. But yeah, it's, it is true. I mean, our focus for the retail was the pedestrian oriented. Sure. Obviously, addressing. The goal of the zoning too, um, mm -hmm. they they do want to put some mid block access to the tracks, so it's it's not going to happen this year. But you know. The, the, Think that you sure. your plan. You're developing for the future plan. Yeah, yeah I get yeah. that. I'll let someone else have a turn. <laughs> All good. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I think that the uh, land acquisition strategy is flawed. Uh, your price per square foot is represents uh, 14 months ago comps, and last week we sold a site at an inferior location for $55 a square foot. The site you're looking at, I've had five calls in the last 10 days that, uh, you know, of people trying to structure deals on this site. It is highly visible. It is a great site. And all the usual suspects are going to be competing with you, and they're well capitalized. So uh, if you want to get a hold of it based on your relationship with this program, don't wait. Do it now. That's my advice. Um, other challenges to the site, you guys may have seen Judge Memorial rebuild, rebuild their football field two years ago. That whole hillside is wrought with artesian springs. They are difficult to find, and the advice from most geotechnical engineers is going to be scrape the site, excavate your basement, and put in control plates for 18 months and watch and see what happens with the water. Okay? So, uh, challenging site, great site though. Yeah. Um, you're, you might have a high water table and it's going to be seasonal because all that water coming off the hillside into some of those uh, subterranean stream beds. Um, I love the fact that you guys identified Gilgale Park as um, a, a notable location close by that. That is like hippie central. It's hilarious. <laughs> if you haven't visited it, you should visit that. It's awesome. Um, I love the walkability score at 88. Uh, I, that's becoming a very notable um, development component for all of us when we're looking at sites. I will note that I have two sites with 92 walkability scores. But anyway, um, um, I really want you guys to refine your cost to demolish and do um, mitigation. Um, I think you're going to be closer to 500,000 on that. Um, and um, how come this is a for lease product? Why didn't you? sell the top floor with rooftop decks to reduce the basis on the whole project and lease out the rest. I like that. I do too. We're just looking for simplicity, but I think that's a simple well, option. We, we well. did talk to several developers and they felt like if you um, structure the deal so that you can convert to condos later, they said that that is such a headache and that ex extra expense isn't really worth it. But we didn't consider breaking it into different um, product types. So that is, that is insightful. The, the feedback that we got is that the expense of doing that up front is, doesn't pay for itself. Okay. Uh, yeah, you could, you could have, if you demarcated the product types um, substantially in terms of their parking, their elevators and such, you could get, you know, uh, $300 plus a square foot for the for sale stuff mm -hmm. and then have uh, reduce your cost basis on the entire project and have the for lease um, as an annuity on the other part of the project. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, and then lastly, uh, I would say um, the name. Uh, great site, bad name. It's cliche, and there's another one in Salt Lake as well. You guys can think of something a lot more um, attractive. Uh, right by the library, there's yeah, an intro. I think it's Bistro. Yeah. Clearwater Lofts. <laughs> Clearwater lofts, <laughs> especially with the springs. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Yeah. A river runs through it. <laughs> okay, um, a couple of questions and some comments. Um, as far as the unit mix, how did you decide on that particular unit mix? Originally, we had three bedrooms in there, and after talking with several developers um, in the area, we felt like the three bedroom was was a non-starter. 
we eliminated that, and it sounded like, um, based on the, comp the comparable properties and what was leasing best, that the two bedroom, two bath, and the studio was going to be our heaviest area. So that's and, and as far as your target market, you, you mentioned the Generation Y. What, what sort of intel? I mean, how did, how did you gather that? I mean, who, who are these people? Are they students? Are they per professionals in the area? I have a whole presentation on that. But yeah. uh, Gen Y is, I mean, so Gen Y is 18 to 34, but we weren't focusing necessarily on students. We feel there'll be a small component of students that, that take up that we're more focused on newly formed heads of household, dual income, professional couples who are focusing on long-term renters and more of a lifestyle community. Um, so hopefully having people that stay a little bit longer. Okay. Um, my, my other comments there, I, I think the press was, was very good. Um, a lot of uh, focus on the, the architectural and on the, the design. I would have liked a little more on the market and um, you know, what's going on in the market, supply and demand. Um, who the competitors are, um, what the, where the market is heading, what's the, the features so the supply, right? Um, there's uh, east side apartments that are going in right now. That, that should be, you know, absorbed and stabilized by the time you guys get done. But there's, there's some other potential sites that, that, are, that are coming up as well. Um, as far as your cost, I uh, bump up your hard cost contingency. Three percent is pretty light. Um, a lender's going to want to see at least five percent um, within that. So that's just my comments. There. I think that's wise. I'd, yeah, I'd be more comfortable ten percent. <laughs> your your because performer looks fine. I mean, your your performer looks fine. Rents are at top of the market. Um, immigration. That's really surprising to see that at dollar sixty some cents. I thought that was in the dollar forty five range. Um, I, I know Broadway, which is the seniors, that's getting about 126 right now per square foot. Mm -hmm. those, are, those are mostly one and, and two bedroom units, and they're small units. But, they're, but that's, what, you know, that's what that's getting. You could probably go smaller units on ones, too. What were you, 780 or something? Yeah. Mm -hmm. you yeah, could, something we were considering if you're really focusing on the Gen Y, you can really taper that down. In fact, your studios can almost be kind of a hyper-efficient unit. Mm -hmm. that, I mean... It almost resembles almost a hotel room. People are using their just it's like a sleeping place to sleep basically. They're dining out. They're you know outdoor athletes. They're biking. They're going to CrossFit. Whatever. That's that's their life, and they come back and sleep. So, I, I think that's a r really good point. That that well, you may not need all that room for parking. You may not. Maybe no. one point one is fine if you throttle it down. And one of the things we did is we leased our parking separately because we know that Gen Y likes that kind of. Affinity yeah. for a la carte amenities, um, and, but yeah, go ahead. Don't but they need to Rocky Anderson on your parking, though. <laughs> I got burned on that. So they, they need it says no parking required, but it's not a marketable project unless right. if you plan. And to you need a place it. to put the bikes yes. and the Good skis point. and all right. that, and and uh, so I think that's important. I I share the concern about staging. I think it's really easy to say, oh, we'll ship it all in and whatnot, but you need that room on site, and it's it, it is a really really. Tight site, so I think you. I think you need to. Find there was no. There was no line item for easements either. I noticed. You might have to acquire some easements or some right of way access or some places to construction easements or things like that. that you should put in your pro forma. And then old sites tend to have environmental issues. So you fla flagged asbestos, but I, I think there may be other things that have happened there too. I don't know what all bakeries use, but generally, when you've had vehicles around and. Things like that. There's a lot of other kinds of cleanup that are necessary. Absolutely. And if there's water moving through those sites, it may not even be on your site anymore. You may have obligations that go beyond the site. So there's there's a lot to look at there, I think. Uh, a land swap deal takes the complications and multiplies them exponentially. Uh, if Because now you have to go and find a site that meets all of their criteria. If you're saying you're going to build a building for them, you've got all of that. I mean, just coming up with some price that you can pay for this site, bang, even if it's a bigger number and you know what it is and can get it under contract, I think that would make it a lot cleaner and, Absolutely. and simpler deal. But I, 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 it's, it's, uh, it's interesting, too. The retail you have is not walkable retail, but I don't think the site justifies walkable retail. Mm -hmm. right. So you may have found tenants that actually can work in that kind of location. A real estate office, just having your sign on the door there has some value around a marquee probably, and yet you don't have that many people are going to be coming and going and, and whatnot. So I think that probably works. Uh, it, it's, 
it's a it's a great neighborhood, but boy, I, I tell you, I worry so much. Maybe it's because I've done so many greenfields things. I worry an awful <laughs> lot about those older sites where you have to knock things down and, and clean them up and go forward. You might also want to do a good sensitivity analysis. I know you're throwing a lot of six cap rates around. If you look at the yield curve, I don't know what that was representing, if that was on stabilization, but usually things take a lot longer on a project like this than you anticipate, so you might be in the seven cap plus territory. You should make sure that that's, you can still dial in the, your respective yields that you're committing to certain people. It, it, your construction time is really fast too. <laughs> And there's some advantages to that, but you know there's also some advantages in getting some lease up that as you're going through construction. Yeah, I didn't ask about phasing. Or yeah. Is this just one big project? Yes, it's big. Wow, it's big. Uh, you're deploying a lot of capital without anything coming back. If you could break it down into three stages, you mitigate your risk for a market turn. Mm -hmm. You'd have you know freestanding phases that can operate by themselves. Obviously, you're going to have upfront costs with trunk line infrastructure and such for all three phases but you're going to mitigate a lot of risk by, by phasing it. Well, it could easily be exactly two. Yeah. Yeah, or, uh, the, the approach was um, the construction costs go down in, in talks with construction uh, general contractors. They don't, they don't prefer... On your PT slab? Is that what you're... Mm, that, that's just what they said. We prefer not to phase the project. Mm -hmm. Just because they can have their their, sure, the group, group, their guys on site the whole time and get them in and out, as opposed to having them come in, leave, and then come back. I think a great I think a great example is right down the street from you guys. Look what Rimrock just did. They did phase one in 07. They watched what was going on. They had all these great entitlements that were able to keep active, and they just put another 420 units in the air. They waited till the times got good again. And they survived, and they did really well on it. So, um, <clears throat> don't let don't let savings and construction costs drive you to deploy that much more capital before you have performed on the development. 